doing? <laughs> okay, I'm going to read uh, another poem by a young local poet. It's called Robert McLaughlin. And this poem is called Void. I could see how someone might not want to go outside, might want to stay a little longer in bed, might skip breakfast, then have a long lunch while reading yesterday's paper, full of news of an abstract world. How a person might sit in a chair for hours on end, just gazing out into their yard, not really watching anything, not really thinking of anything in particular, not really feeling anything. Leaving the dishes for another day, not answering the phone, not checking the mail, not making the bed, sitting down to an open book, reading just one page, then having their mind wander off, not far, but just away from the page, looking around their home, scanning all their possessions with empty eyes as if the sculptures, pictures, books, hits, chairs and clocks all belong to someone else. Now their coffee is going cold, their words slipped into canyons of isolation, and they don't even ask why anymore. Yes, I could see how that could happen to someone. No, I'm, I'm going to read something from um, uh, Kieran Carson, who was a great Belfast flute player and poet, um, had this book called Last Night's Fun. So I'm just going to read um, a piece from that. Um, it's called The Dairy Maid. <laughs> In the old times in Ireland, you know, there were what we call the hiring fairs. That's where a boy or a girl would go to the hiring fair to hire out with a farmer as a farmer's servant, or a dairymaid, or a lad just as a farmer's servant around the yard, helping him with his work on the land. And this little girl went to the hiring fair one day, and what they used to do was stand in a line all day. Nowadays, they'd call it a queue. But, oh, she stood all day, and every boy and girl in the whole line was taken, and she was left there alone. And nobody had taken her. And she was thinking of going home and telling her parents that nobody had hired her. And a funny little man came up to her with a cocked hat on him. Now, you wouldn't believe it, but this cocked hat was coloured pink. And he had a jacket with brass buttons on it, and that was coloured a bright, vivid blue. And he had a pair of knee breeches on him, coloured emerald green. And he had a pair of yellow stockings on him, up to the top of his knee breeches. And a pair of beautiful shiny brown boots on him. And he had a big moustache, like the handlebars of a bicycle. And a beard that was reaching down to the brass buckle of his belt. And he said, did nobody take you, little girl? Well, sir, she said, the way it is, my parents told me to arrange how much I'd be paid for my service with you. Because there were contracts for six months. And oh, he felt her biceps and he said, you're a strong little girl, I'll pay you well. Well, they travelled up a high hill and down into a low valley between green hedges and ditches and they left the hard road and went on the soft road between green hedges and ditches and they came then to a place where there were trees growing both sides of the road. What we'd call in literature a sylvan tunnel. <laughs> and when they came out of the sylvan tunnel, the road took a sharp turn to the left and they came into a clearing. And there was the most comfortable little thatched cottage you ever saw. What do you call that little girl, he said. Oh, the hut or the house or whatever you please, sir. No, no, he says, that's the great castle of Straw Bungle. He took a big iron key out of his pocket and he opened the door and went in and he threw a bottle of turf on the fire. What do you call that, little girl? That's the hot or the heat or whatever you please, sir. No, he said, that's hot cockaloro. And the next thing, the cat came in and stretched with the fire. What do you call that, little girl? 
that's the kit or the cat or whatever you please, sir. No, no, he said, that's white-faced simony. And she said, if I may make so bold, what do I call you, sir? Oh, my name's Domna Perry Septo, he said. And I think we'll put down the kettle and we'll make tea. And you can picture her. Dutiful little girl that she was, over to the crock of water with the pannikin, filling the kettle. What do you call that little girl? That's the wet or the water or whatever you please, sir. No, he says, that's pondalorum. And she hung the kettle on the crane over the fire. And then he took off his boots. He was tired after walking the whole day through the fair. What do you call those little girls? Well, your boots or your brogues, whatever you please, sir. No, he said, they're my hay down treaders. <laughs> and then he rattled the knee of his knee breeches at her. And what do you call those little girls? Ah, your breeches, your breeks, whatever you please, sir. No, he said, they're my fortune's crackers. And he said, now, while we're waiting for the kettle to boil, I'll show you upstairs to where you're going to sleep. I'll show you to your room where you're going to live for the next six months. And going up the stairs, he says, what do you call those, little girl? Oh, the steps or the stairs or whatever you please, sir. No, he said, that's the wooden hill. And he threw open a door at the top of the stairs and he showed her her bed in the room. What do you call that, little girl? Oh, the bunk or the bed or whatever you please, sir. No, he said, that's the barnacle. And they had supper and they milked the cow and they locked up and away to bed for the night. And in the middle of the night, there was a rap, rap, a knock at his door. What's wrong, little girl, he said. Rise up from your barnacle, Domna Pear Septu, and put on your fortune's crackers and your hay down treaders and come down the wooden hill because white-faced simony has a spot of hot cockalorum on his tail and if we don't pour pondalorum on it quick, the great castle of straw bumble will be in hot cockalorum. Ha, ha, ha.